At this point in time, Halloween Horror Nights has more than established itself as one of the most important events within the world of theme parks. These days, it has become a cultural icon in its own right. Even as someone who lives in the UK, it isn't that rare for me to see merchandise from this event sported by visitors to my local theme parks. Its popularity seems to grow year on year, and the scale of the event has certainly grown in unison with this. Much of this growth has been in step with the general growth of Universal Studios Orlando, but some of this growth can be attributed to a few key moments in the event's history, specifically the inclusion of two IPs, The Walking Dead and Stranger Things. IPs, meaning intellectual properties, have been present at Halloween Horror Nights in some form right from the start. The very first Halloween Horror Nights was held in 1991 and featured only one haunted house. This was the Dungeon of Terror, themed as the name would make you expect to look like a dungeon. This house featured familiar characters such as Chucky, the Universal Monsters, and even a Xenomorph. Then, for the event's second year, the very first house based entirely on an IP arrived. This was The People Under the Stairs, based on Wes Craven's film of the same name. This house was so popular that it returned the next year, along with a new house based on the film Psycho. It was actually during this third year of the event that the very first entirely original house was on offer. Following this, original idea houses really became the main body of the event, with only a few Universal Monster or movie promotional houses, such as 2001's The Mummy Returns, The Curse Continues, Wanted House. With the introduction of Jack the Clown and original house ideas, such as Scary Tales, Run, and Body Collectors, this was where the excitement of the event was to be found. The horror films that were dominating the box office certainly weren't present at Halloween Horror Nights just yet. In 2006, the event Sweet 16, Psycho and the People Under the Stairs got houses once again to commemorate the event's origins. But it wasn't until 2007 that IPs truly took the main stage. This year, Jack the Clown returned for his Carnival of Carnage, joined this time by Freddy Krueger, Jason Voorhees, and Leatherface all of whom had their own haunted houses. The rest of the houses this year were made up of ones based off of Universal's own ideas, and then there was one more IP house based on the thing. This made for a year that was dominated by some of the largest players as far as horror IPs are concerned. A fitting crew to join Jack the Clown, if you ask me. This certainly received a lot of media attention, as Universal plastered these iconic characters all over their marketing. It may well be this very year that first got Universal thinking about the potential power of IPs to grow the event. However, with less than a year between events, Halloween Horror Nights didn't repeat this in 2008. But by 2009, Universal had got a new lineup of IPs ready to go. The theme for this year was ripped from the silver screen, headed by The Usher, the perfect icon to introduce a variety of movie-based IPs. There were two original houses, three based on classic Universal monsters, one based on Chucky, one based on Saw, and a final house full of some of the biggest names in the world of horror. Universal clearly saw the benefit of featuring characters from their own horror movies at the event. But it was far from a necessity, and yet again in 2010, for the event's 20th anniversary, no IPs were present within the houses that year. As this was a big anniversary year, and just generally a year of growth for Universal, thanks to the opening of the Wizarding World of Harry Potter, I'm sure the event had more than enough to draw in new guests. 2011 saw only a house based off of the thing, but this would be the final year to date not dominated by IPs. Even with the inconsistent presence of IPs, it's clear that by this point, Universal by no means felt that IP was necessary to feature within their haunted houses. But in 2012, this would all change. You're gonna have to try to survive the zombie apocalypse, only now you're not in your living room watching it. Living it. 2012 was a major turning point for Halloween Horror Night in regards to the presence of IPs. This was the year that saw the very first house based on AMC's The Walking Dead come to the event. It was also joined by Silent Hill, Alice Cooper, and a Penn and Teller house. 
In 2012, The Walking Dead was the hot horror property. Just about to air its third season, The Walking Dead had brought on a wave of zombie popularity, and unsurprisingly attracted a large number of new attendees to Halloween Horror Night. Universal were clearly impressed by the number of people it attracted, and thanks to this success, The Walking Dead returned the next year, along with some other rather impressive IPs. 2013 also featured The Cabin in the Woods, Resident Evil, Evil Dead, and An American Werewolf in London. Cabin in the Woods had been released in 2011, and the Evil Dead remake was released in the spring of 2013. With this, there were two haunted houses based off of some of the biggest names in modern horror cinema. Resident Evil saw the very first house to be based off of a video game, and then there was an American Werewolf in London, one of the most iconic horror films ever made. And at this point, the house itself has also been established as one of Halloween Horror Night's best and most iconic eventually actually returning in 2015. With this, 2013 was the first year to be truly dominated by IPs. Plus, the entire park was turned into one giant The Walking Dead scare zone. This year was not just the year of The Walking Dead, it was the year of the IPs. It set a trend that really hasn't slowed down or stopped since. Still with The Walking Dead present, 2014, 2015, and then 2016 saw an incredibly impressive array of IPs. There were classics in the form of Alien vs Predator, Halloween, Freddy vs Jason, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and The Exorcist. Then there were more modern properties in the form of Dracula Untold, From Dusk Till Dawn, The Purge, Insidious, The Krampus, and American Horror Story. These IPs really were the big draw of the event, and they certainly got many people excited. Halloween Horror Nights was giving us the opportunity to see some of the most iconic moments from the big and little screen. Admittedly, it was incredibly exciting to see the Sawyer family home, to visit Haddonfield, to attend The Purge, visit Murder House, and so much more. Yet, even with all this going on, there was something that occurred in 2015 that pushed all this to the back of many people's minds. Or should I say, someone. 2015 it was Halloween Horror Night's 25th year, and for this anniversary, two very special guests returned. From 2000 until 2011, icons had played an important role at Halloween Horror Night with pretty much every year receiving a brand new or returning icon, which built on the overall lore of the event, and this helped to create a cohesive theme. Unfortunately though, they were largely forgotten in 2012, 2013, and 2014, perhaps because The Walking Dead was very much filling this role. In a way, this IP was the event's icon. It was the thing that featured on promotion, the map, and as the big house of the year, but much to fans' excitement, 2015 saw Jack the Clown return for the first time since 2010. Along with Jack came Chance, who together absolutely dominated the event. IP was still important this year, and likely what many new fans came to see. But for almost every guest who attended, it was Jack and Chance that they left remembering. <laughs> Looks like I win again. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Did you miss me? Thanks to this, Chance returned as the icon in 2016. But unfortunately, this wasn't enough to keep the trend going any longer. 2017 did see a sort of icon in the form of Bones, but with such a small presence and very little backstory, it wasn't exactly what fans wanted. This was also the first year in a long time without The Walking Dead, something many fans were happy about, as most were getting pretty bored of this IP. The IPs that brought the excitement this year were The Shining, Ash vs Evil Dead, Saw, The Horrors of Blumhouse, American Horror Story, and Trick or Treat, which received not a house but a scare zone. This year was, in many ways, a sort of in-between year. Universal were without a major and trending IP, and seemed at a loss for what to do in regards to icons. But nevertheless, the array of IPs 
movies was still pretty strong. Many assumed Universal were trying to use American Horror Story to replace The Walking Dead, but as it had pretty much lost relevance by 2017 thanks to some poor seasons, this was never likely to work. Thankfully, by 2018, Universal had more than found the solution to their Walking Dead problem. <laughs> 2018 saw the arrival of Stranger Things to Halloween Horror Nights. Again, without an icon, Halloween Horror Nights took on a sort of 80s theme, thanks to the wave of societal nostalgia brought on by Stranger Things. Stranger Things really was one of the most popular things in the world in 2018, and needless to say, it had a great impact on attendance to Halloween Horror Nights. 2019 saw this property return and again featured a sort of retro 80s inspired theme. Both years also had a great selection of other IPs, but Stranger Things was by far the one which promoted the event the most. With the arrival of Stranger Things, the event seemed to grow in many ways, not only in regards to attendance. 2015 had seen the arrival of the Tribute Store, something which has continued since and certainly has resulted in the gradual growth of merchandise on offer. But with the insane popularity of Stranger Things, Universal knew they had an opportunity to really capitalise off of this. Stranger Things is different from a more traditional horror IP, something which did lead to many complaints from fans. A lot of people perceived this show to not be scary enough for the event, and to be largely responsible for lowering the age demographic. Now, this may be true, but Stranger Things is far from the first PG-13 IP to be featured. Plus, the event has never had any strict age limit. I will admit the Stranger Things houses have never been the scariest, but what scares each of us is different. Plus, the more I attend the event, the less scary it gets, as I know what to expect something I'm sure many returning fans would agree with. Halloween Horror Nights isn't really about the scares for us. It's more about seeing the immense creativity on display. When I first visited Halloween Horror Nights, I was far easier to scare. But these days, I know what to expect. If I want to be scared, there are other, more intense Halloween events for me to visit. But if I want to be impressed by scale, design and creativity, well, there's no other event that truly competes. By the time Stranger Things arrived at Halloween Horror Nights, it was well established as an important part of pop culture. And with this, there were many aspects of the show that had become pretty iconic. These, strangely enough, included Eggo waffles. Therefore, it's not a shock to see that Universal decided they had to make waffles available at the event in 2018. Thanks to this, 2018 saw the arrival of themed food to Halloween Horror Nights in ways never present before. Now, Blinky Cups, Twisted Taters, and the Now Gone Blood Bags had always been integral to the event. But truly themed food, not so much. By 2018, food festivals and themed food were quickly becoming one of the key ways for a theme park to make some money, partly thanks to the Instagram and YouTube culture. Event-specific and cool-looking food was majorly popular. Thus, we may have seen the arrival of themed food to Halloween Horror Nights even without Stranger Things, but there's no denying that as things went, the two are inextricably linked. In 2019, we saw even more themed food, and even the arrival of slightly themed food booths. By 2021, Universal decided to go all in on the theming, and cohesively decorated all the booths. By 2022 and in 2023, and of course this year, this has led to IP food booths. Such as ones based off of Chucky, The Last of Us, A Quiet Place, Insidious, and of course, Ghostbusters with the s'more on offer this year being one of the most popular and photographed parts of the event. Then there are even ones based off of original Halloween Horror Nights ideas, such as Meets Meets and the Triplets birthday party this year. Another Stranger Things spurred on arrival is the presence of a photo experience and subsequently a themed bar at Universal's Cabana Bay Resort. In 2019, Cabana Bay featured a Stranger Things themed photo experience, exclusively for hotel guests. 
something which has returned every year since with a different theme. And along with these, the Icon Bar or the Spooky Swizzle Lounge. This year, there are even themed drinks at other hotel bars and photo opportunities and decorations in every single Universal Hotel lobby. All of this outside presence of Halloween Horror Nights is likely also what resulted in the creation of the Dead Coconut Club in 2022, which has of course come back every year since and is something we really love to check out each year. For the 30th anniversary in 2021, Stranger Things did not return, but thankfully the presence of icons did, as did an array of incredible IPs and original houses. Post their 30th anniversary, Halloween Horror Nights seem to be, at least in my opinion, getting many things right. Icons are again becoming a staple. In 2022, we got the Pumpkin Lord. In 2023, we had Dr. Oddfellow. And this year, we have Sinister and Surreal. IP is also still important. Since 2021, we have received long-time requests, Beetlejuice and Chucky, and modern classics, The Haunting of Hill House, A Quiet Place, and more. With this, the original houses by no means suffer, and as I will cover in a future video, still often come out on top. In fact, this year, there is a lot of talk about the IP selection being pretty weak. The only truly fresh IP this year is A Quiet Place. Other than this, everything else is pretty much a repeat. We've already seen Insidious and Blumhouse and the now staple Universal Monsters, and a more popular Ghostbusters film has already been present. Some are seeing this as a weak selection of IPs, and while I don't quite agree that it's as weak as some people suggest, I can see what everyone means. Some are seeing this as simply an effect of Epic Universe taking up time and money, but others think that it might be a sign that Universal are realizing that IPs aren't the be-all and end-all of Halloween Horror Nights anymore. In fact, the event is so popular these days, it's hard to imagine Universal need anything else to attract more guests to the park. Frequent fear passes with Express sold out faster than ever before this year, which isn't surprising. The sort of fans who purchase these need no IPs to convince them to attend. But single day tickets are also doing just fine, so perhaps the Halloween Horror Nights brand is big enough to not need IPs to attract even the general public these days. Nevertheless, IP houses are far from stopping at the event. Throughout these years, Halloween Horror Nights has proven itself to be pretty successful at obtaining IPs. Practically nothing feels like too much of an ask anymore. IPs certainly do attract a bigger audience, but Halloween Horror Nights also seem to be aware that it isn't these which truly please their ever-growing legion of fans. IPs have paid off in many ways, increasing both the size and the budget of the event. Today, we have more theming and more houses than ever before. Yes, the event may be a little busier, and this can negatively impact the event. Scare zones are becoming less about scares and no one enjoys the long lines. But overall, Halloween Horror Nights has got better every year. Year on year, the houses themselves get more and more impressive. A quick scare is something even the smallest Halloween event can achieve. But large-scale facades and flying scare actors, well, they certainly aren't. I'm not going to argue that Halloween Horror Nights is the scariest event out there, because it just isn't true. But the most expansive, well, that's hard to argue. A visit to Halloween Horror Nights today comes with more than it ever used to. The horror has seeped its way into just about everything. Better is certainly subjective. And if you're going to be scared out of your mind, then sure, Halloween Horror Nights hasn't got better. But if you're coming for a fully immersive and truly impressive experience, I personally believe that it has. Thanks to the growth, spurred on largely by The Walking Dead and Stranger Things, the event can now offer a large-scale horror-themed experience that never would have been possible before. Thank you so much for watching. When do you think was the biggest turning point for Halloween Horror Nights? Let us know in the comments. Also, please like, subscribe, and check out my links in the description, and I'll see you all in the fog.